Good morning. Good morning. I would like to call to order the May 9th, 2018 meeting of the Committee on Strategic Planning and Service Delivery. Would the Secretary please call the roll? Yes, Reverend Miller. Here. Uh, Mr. Peterson. Here. Ms. Alvarez-Alas. Here. Uh, Chairman Irvine. Here. We have a quorum with all four members of the committee present, finally. Thank you. Um, now, this is a little bit exciting, but our first order of business today is approval of multiple sets of committee minutes, so please <laughs> sit upright. We will vote on each set of minutes separately. May I have a motion to approve the committee minutes of June 14th, 2017? I'll second. Would the secretary please call the roll? Yes. Um, Mr. Peterson? Yes. Ms. Alvarez-Alice? Yes. Uh, Mr. Miller? Yes. And Chairman Irvine? Yes. That motion is approved with four yes votes. Great. Thank you. Um, may I have a motion to approve the committee minutes of July 12th, 2017? So moved. Would the secretary please call the roll? Yes, Mr. Peterson. Yes. Ms. Alvarez-Alice. Yes. Mr. Miller. Yes. And Chairman Irvine. I abstain. That motion passed with four, three yes votes and one abstention by Director Irvine. May I have a motion to approve the committee minutes of November 15th, 2017? Second. Would the secretary please call the roll? Yes, Mr. Peterson. Yes. Ms. Alvarez-Alice. I will abstain. Uh, Mr. Miller. Yes. Chairman Irvine. Yes. That motion is approved with three yes votes and one abstention by Director Alvaro Rosales. Thank you. May I have a motion to approve the committee minutes of January 10th, 2018? So moved. I'll second. Uh, would the secretary please call the roll? Yes. Mr. Peterson? Yes. Ms. Alvaro Rosales? Yes. Uh, Reverend Miller? Abstain. Director Irvine? Yes. That motion is approved with three yes votes and one abstention by Reverend Miller. Okay. That was fun. Let's do it again. Um, <laughs> 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 okay, thank you. Uh, I believe um, CTA President Dorval Carter has a few remarks you'd like to make. Yes, I think um, you're, you're about to get a presentation from Michael Connolly, and Michael has just been named the new uh, Chief Planning Officer for CTA. Uh, as many of you know, we have um, uh, a major capital project that we're about to begin called RPM. Um, that's going to take a tremendous amount of resources and, and um, uh, time uh, for staff and, and, and others. Uh, as a result, I've made some, some organizational changes to really put us in a position to take on that additional project and the, and the impact that it's going to have. I've created a new group at CTA that is focused on the Red Purple Modernization Project. That group will be headed up by Chris Bouchelle. Uh, who was asked to, and I have agreed to allow him to take on what is the biggest capital project in the history of CTA. Uh, in addition to that, because Chris is going to be taking over that responsibility, I've asked Carol Murray to become the new Chief Infrastructure Officer. Uh, and she has agreed to do that, and she will take on the ongoing responsibilities of the rest of our capital program, as well as our power and way uh, work that we do on an ongoing basis. Um, and then, as the final piece of that process, I asked Michael Connolly, who had been the Vice President of, of Schedule Planning at, at CTA, to become the new Chief Planning Officer. And with that, that leads into Mike being the one who presents to you the presentation on, on the 31 today. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. You got it? Um, I'm Mike Connolly, your Chief Planning Officer. The item before you for consideration today is an ordinance which would authorize a, a fifth extension of the experiment for service on the number 31 31st Street bus. This would begin in June and last up until the fall bus pick service change, which occurs in early September uh, of this year, just after Labor Day. Service was begun on this route in September of 2016 the target ridership goal you can see on the slide is that red dotted line across the top of the, of the chart. Uh, that is 830 average weekday rides. The ridership has not reached this goal, although CTA has worked closely uh, with the community, local businesses, and the aldermen involved to promote and support this route. Um, the additional experiment period recommended uh, with this ordinance will allow for an assessment of the effect of the current advertising campaign on the ridership for this route. Uh, Brian Steele, Vice President of Communications and Marketing, will share some more information about this campaign. 
Directors, good morning. Uh, Brian Steele, Vice President of Communications and Marketing. Since the launch of the first 31 pilot back in 2016, we've put behind it a promotional and advertising effort to increase awareness of the route and to hopefully spur uh, ridership. Uh, in terms of the outreach, we've had uh, 18 meetings uh, with the two impacted aldermen. We've provided regular ridership updates to the aldermen. I uh, had multiple community meetings, uh, and we've done some advertising and some other promotional efforts that I'll get into in just a moment. You may recall that when we launched this, we created a flyer and posters to distribute through businesses and other entities in the community. Uh, we also recently, as part of our second round of promotion, uh, did a newspaper advertising buy that I'll talk more about in just a moment. Uh, interesting uh, aspect of the promotional effort uh, behind the 31 was a coordinated campaign with the 31st Ward uh, for some social media promotion uh, called Snap on 31, where it asked riders to take selfies of themselves riding the 31 and then show that picture to a variety of businesses uh, in the community for discounts, free items, things of that nature. Uh, and of course, we supported that with our online resources, including a website and social media promotion. These are the advertisements that we ran in three of the community newspapers uh, that publish within the service area. We work closely with the community groups to identify which newspapers they think would be uh, most read uh, and most uh, attracted to by people in the community. So uh, we place the advertisements in the Bridgeport News and then also in two Chinese language newspapers. Uh, we actually worked not only with our translation services but also with people within the Chinese community who are part of the 31 effort for them to review the copy and make sure that it, uh, uh, that it, that it looked good and said what it needed to say. Those ads are running, uh, some started in March, uh, some started in April, and they're running through Memorial Day. So uh, 12 weeks or more of advertisement so we can continue the message and continue to get the word out. A little bit more about the SNAP campaign, 31 SNAP campaign that we mentioned earlier. Uh, Alderman Thompson uh, held a little press event, as you can see from the, from the picture, and was really helpful in signing up 20 local businesses uh, to be a part of this. Uh, we also did some posters to promote this, translating them into Spanish and, and uh, Chinese as well. Uh, you can see Bridgeport Coffee offered a discount, uh, some free ice cream uh, at Fabulous Freddy's and other retailers. So it was something that the uh, local businesses really appreciated uh, and really were uh, excited to, be per uh, to participate in. Uh, these are some of the uh, display and print ads that we did for the first campaign back in September uh, using the theme of reasons to ride the number 31. Uh, it's kind of hard to see on the screen, but along the route map, uh, we put little dots uh, to reflect some of the attractions and entities that are along the route. Uh, grab a few groceries, visit a friend, go to the pharmacy. These were the things that we heard from the 31 community that they anticipated that the ridership uh, would be most interested in. Uh, and then just a, a recap of our digital materials. In addition to the uh, standalone website, uh, we did uh, a number of pieces via social media, our Twitter account, and Facebook page. Any questions? Thank you. E yes, I have a question. Well, it's probably two-part. How often are we meeting with the aldermen on the progress of the ridership? And number two, will this be the final experiment for this bus line? Because it seemed like we, this is our fifth experiment trying to get it up to 832. So do we have a cutoff to say, OK, this will be the expectation moving forward? I can handle the first part of that. In terms of the outreach to both the aldermen and the stakeholders, it occurs on a very regular basis, uh, at minimum monthly, oftentimes more than that. Uh, ever since September 2016, our uh, government community relations group has made sure that all the stakeholders are aware of what the performance is, uh, what assistance we need in helping expand the promotions. Uh, so there's been regular communications uh, over the last almost two years of the experimental realm. And I think really the, the answer to your second question is it depends on what happens with the ridership. Um, we, we, we were hoping, the, in fact, the goal of this extension is to give us some time after the ad campaign has run for its, for its 12 weeks to see if that has an effect on the ridership. So we really, I, I don't have an answer for you today, but we will have an answer over the next two months to be able to share with you what the ridership looks like if there has been a change 
and if this latest ad campaign has increased that ridership, thus far, none of the earlier advertising or none of the earlier work has increased the ridership to meet the target. So. Last year we had a drop, didn't we, during the summertime because we, we lose a lot of the students from IIT. Is we right? did. The, the ridership profile on here is, is significantly college students at IIT during the, the academic school year and then much lower during their Christmas break and during their summer period as well. Um, how does this route rank among the um, CTA routes in terms of meeting its target and ridership? It, it's, it's, in the, it's in the bottom 10 of 128 routes for ridership, for the, the average weekday ridership. Uh, and it's in, the, it's in the lower 25% for productivity, passengers per hour. Uh, and that varies. It's, of course, as I think the slide showed, it was higher in October, uh, and then it was up a little bit. Uh, in, the, in the lower third of the routes, and when it dropped uh, to an average of uh, you know, fewer, fewer rides when, when, the, when the, uh, the IIT students were out of session, it was the second to the lowest route in terms of productivity. So it's, it's in the very bottom uh, of, our, of our rankings. Can you, well, can you just review, what's the, um, what was the, the thinking in terms of not extending it all the way to the 31st Street Beach during the summer? We already have a route that serves that beach, uh, the 35th route that we had begun and actually extended to the beach before we even started looking at this 31st. It is down. That 552, that's, and that's the average for March, the most recent month that we have figured. Yes. What are the hours? Uh, it, it, it runs uh, starting at 10 a.m. and runs until 7 p.m. With two buses on the, on the service, 30-minute frequency. A lot of residential in that area. There's, there's a good bit of residential on the east end surrounding the, the shopping center there. Uh, but Lake Meadow Shopping Center and just to the south of it. Uh, and then the, the, the density drops as you go to the west and it becomes much more uh, old industrial. Uh, and then you enter an area, a corridor along there. You're in the corridor because it ends, it ends at the orange line at Ashland, which is very, uh, very much industrial area there. So Ashland and it goes how far west? Ashland is as far west as it goes, as far east to uh, Lake Meadows Shopping Center, right, right across from the alderman's office there. Yeah, the, the only reason I mention the hours is because 10 o'clock is kind of after rush hour. So mm -hmm. if I'm going to work and I'm coming downtown, let's say I get on 31, I can take it to King Drive, King Drive on downtown. And I don't know if you've heard that feedback from the community that one of the things that could be holding down ridership are the hours. Because again, 10 o'clock in the morning, every, all of, you know, anyone who's got to work is up and gone. Yes. People are at school. So I'm just trying to think, you know, we started at 6 to 2, 6 to 3. Because the hours now are from 10 to? To 7. 10 to 7. Yeah. I don't know if you've heard that from the community or from the alderman that starting it at 10. You've kind of missed a huge, because if you look at our ridership in the city period, you know, it's that five to six, five to eight or nine when folks are trying to get to work. So starting at 10 could be an issue in terms of just people needing access to public transit. Because then you're kind of opening yourself up to seniors and, you know, just folks kind of needing to run errands versus individuals, yes. especially in the morning. The afternoon, the evening, yeah, from four to seven. And I would be curious to see ridership probably from 10 three and then see what it's like maybe from four to seven to see if you're actually picking up people coming back from work versus not being able to pick them up going to work. So it'll be interesting to see if you break that out, uh, Mike, and see what yeah. is it like in the evening maybe from four to seven Yeah. to see if you've got people using it as a way to get home, but they're not using it to get to work because we're starting something. Mm -hmm. Are there any more questions? Thank you. Um, I forgot to say it at the outset, but this has been a review of an ordinance authorizing a fifth experiment for bus route number 3131st. Uh, if there are no further questions, may I have a motion to place this item on the omnibus? So moved. Second. Um, 
And uh, I would like to um, have a motion to recommend board approval of the omnibus. I'll second. Would the secretary please call the roll? Yes. Uh, Mr. Peterson? Yes. Ms. Alvarez-Alice? Yes. Mr. Miller? Yes. Chairman Irvine? Yes. Uh, that motion is approved with four yes votes. Thank you. Um, may I have a motion to adjourn? All in favor, oh, sorry. All in favor say aye. Aye. Thank you. We're adjourned. Thank you. Hold on one second. You're going to go to finance. One second, Alex. Are you ready to go to finance? You are always ready, aren't you? <laughs> no, because with this, we, we notice it immediately after strategic okay. planning, so okay. we take care of it. All right. We've been burned before, so we do like that now. Right. Alex, Thanks. whenever you want. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I would like to call to order the May 9th, 2018 meeting of the Committee on Finance, Audit and Budget. Will the secretary call the roll, please? Yes. Mr. Miller. Ms. Irvine. Here. Ms. Alvarez Alice. Here. Mr. Peterson. Here. Mr. Youngblood. Here. Chairman, here. Chairman Silva. Here. We have a quorum with all six members of the committee present. Our first order of business today is the approval of the committee minutes of April 18, 2018. May I have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Second. Will the secretary call the roll, please? Yes, Mr. Miller. Yes. Ms. Irvine. Yes. Ms. Alvarez Alice. Yes. Mr. Peterson. Yes. Mr. Youngblood. Abstain. Chairman Silva. Yes. That motion is approved with six yes votes. Our next, next order of business is the review of the finance report. Jeremy. Good morning. I'm Jeremy Fine, your chief financial officer and I'll be presenting the uh, March uh, revenue and expense numbers. <coughs> Bless you. Bless you. Thank you. So with regard to uh, March revenues, we continue to see progress on fare box and passes coming in at a favorable variance to budget. Uh, these are primarily due to special events that we saw in March, uh, St. Patty's Day uh, in the anti-gun march uh, that was held downtown. So we see uh, fare and pass totals up 1.2 million for the month of March. Uh, unfortunately, that is offset by the reduced fare subsidy reduction that we continue to see from the state of 1.2 million. non fare box revenues uh, are approximately at budget but slightly down. Uh, the first quarter is traditionally a, uh, is a tough advertising uh, quarter, uh, but we will expect to see improvements as we go into the second quarter. Uh, these uh, trajectories are similar to what we see on a year-to-date basis. Again, fare box and pass totals are up on a year-to-date basis uh, versus the budget. Uh, the reduced fare subsidy continues to be a drag on overall revenues, and non-fare box uh, revenues are you know, slightly down, but again, uh, not unexpected in the first quarter. So total revenues on a year-to-date basis are down $2.5 million. Uh, obviously, if we had received all of our reduced fare reimbursement, uh, we would be in positive territory on a year-to-date basis. With regard to our expenses, uh, we continue to hold the line across uh, our various expense categories, uh, but I would like to highlight with regard to labor, uh, as we uh, discussed in prior months, uh, you know, the labor line does not account for the uh, ATU contract that was put in place. Uh, per our usual budgeting process. Uh, but, so we're, sl we're showing a slight uh, unfavorable uh, variance there on the labor line for the month of March. Materials and fuel, though, continue to be favorable. Uh, so we see positive variance there. Uh, power, uh, injuries and damages, and security services are relatively flat to budget. And then other expenses, uh, you know, just continues to show our continued efforts to control our expenses. Uh, and tighten our belts, and we see that we almost have $2.4 million of favorability on the other expense line. So overall, for the month of March, uh, we're favorable to budget with regard to expenses to the tune of $1.1 million, uh, which more than offsets the uh, revenue drag that we saw for the month of March of, of $200,000. So net-net, uh, we're up approximately $900,000 for the month of March. On a year-to-date basis, uh, again, we see uh, somewhat similar trajectories on a line-item basis. Uh, labor continues uh, to have the effect of uh, the ATU contract material. 
uh, in the first couple of months, uh, January and February, uh, you know, we saw you know, the impact of uh, bad weather. But again, as we went into March and as we expect to go further, uh, we'll see uh, favorability uh, in the month of March and hopefully beyond. Fuel, again, was impacted by the fact that we started the buses up uh, earlier to get them warmed up for going out on the routes. Uh, so we saw we see some slight unfavorability on a year to date basis. But again, that is reversing, as we saw for the month of March. Uh, power injuries and damages and security services, uh, basically at budget, if not slightly above. And again, our star performer for other expenses, uh, almost four point four million dollars uh, positive for the year to date. So we have uh, about eight hundred thousand dollars of favorability on a year to date basis. Uh, which offsets, which is starting to offset some of that drag that we see on the revenues on a year-to-date basis. So net-net, uh, we're down about 1.7. But again, uh, as we move forward throughout the year, uh, we'll look to you know, further uh, implement uh, cost controls and see what we can do to further enhance revenues uh, to offset that drag. Our three commodities that we purchase uh, again, uh, as I highlighted previously, we have positive uh, month-to-date uh, variants for the three commodities. We have purchased all that we typically purchase uh, for the year of 2018. So we're 80% uh, fixed for fuel, 100% for power, and then 70% for natural gas. Uh, we'll look for opportunities to continue to purchase, uh, particularly fuel, as we move forward. Uh, but you know, just due to uh, international uh, uncertainty in the fuel oil industry uh, right now you know we're uh, we're not purchasing uh, for 2019 yet uh, but we will look to make selective purchases as we move forward yeah the, the withdrawal of uh, United States of the Iran agreement uh, has moved the the oil okay up do you see any so, so there's two factors that are driving oil uh, prices up right now. Uh, obviously, as you indicated, the uh, Iran situation, uh, you know, was was somewhat telegraphed and expected in the industry. So that has been factored in. Also, the summer driving season uh, is starting to hit as uh, you know the refineries are purchasing oil uh, for you know gas production for summer driving. Uh, so you know you start seeing it kind of going up now. Uh, anyway. Uh, but again, this uncertainty with regard to Iran in general, but Iran's oil production in particular, uh, you know, has seen oil prices higher, which you've probably seen even at the pump, uh, you know, than they have been, you know, in recent past. Uh, again, you know, we will continue to monitor the market uh, and make selective purchases as uh, things become hopefully a little bit more relaxed in the oil um, pricing market. Any questions? Yeah, how, how long do you really wait? I mean, let's say, for example, you see this continuing trend of upward pricing, and you're at June, July, and August. When do you say, guess what? It doesn't look like this is going to reverse itself. You better lock in now. I, mean, I know you work with advisors on it, but it, is there a cutoff where you, where you just basically say, we need to lock in? Yes, so uh, great question. So we do work with the advisors, uh, Amorosco in this case. Uh, on what kind of the historic trends are uh, for certain market periods. So again, you know, the, the early spring, summer uh, time frame is, you know, traditionally a little bit more rocky in the pricing. Uh, you know, again, we'll be monitoring that market, um, making selective purchases. We do uh, work with Amoresco to, to target, you know, what, what kind of pricing should we be targeting, being realistic as to uh, market conditions today in terms of oil production in, uh, in Iran and oil production in Venezuela uh, and global demand and, and working through that. So yes, we, uh, we have you know, a larger strategy looking at historic production levels, uh, demand levels, and then you know, what is realistic in the, in the current market. How does that purchasing even line up with what we're doing as a country to generate our own? So uh, you know it's a it's an interesting uh, interesting uh, question as well because you know obviously uh, West Texas uh, oil you know is seeing a, a resurgence uh, you know shale production in the in the U S is seeing a uh, you know a spike up as well so as oil prices go up uh, you know our uh, domestic oil becomes much more um, you know the the new uh, wildcatting that they have to do to identify the the oil fields. 
pull the oil out of the ground uh, becomes more you know profitable so you'll start seeing more uh, you know what's considered West Texas crude uh, coming online uh, you know yeah, here in I the know, future I know they approved the Alaska pipeline but it mm -hmm. won't have any impact now because they're just developing it but I started to wonder you know it's interesting what's going on around the world but at the end of the day too I'm wondering how much of our purchasing is done within the states yeah, I, I can follow up with you on, on the percentage that's uh, domestic versus uh, international. Okay. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about the advertising item? So advertising uh, traditionally after uh, the holidays you know, usually goes a little bit more dormant than what you see uh, with regard to you know, second, third, fourth quarters. Mm -hmm. uh, so again, we anticipate uh, based on you know, the, the, the um, you know what we've seen out there on the on the on the system uh, during the second quarter. Uh, you know those revenues going up uh, as we go into April and May uh, results. So uh, you know we've benefited from the fact that uh, firms like Facebook have had some uh, you know negative press. Uh, so they've been out there trying to get in front of it with regard to their own advertising, uh, which we've benefited from greatly as a system. Uh, so we're very excited about the platform that we've built out, uh, both on static and uh, electronic uh, billboards, both on the urban street level as well as the platform uh, panels. Uh, so those have been, uh, you know, very marketable, and we'll see, you know, some significant improvements in our uh, advertising revenues going into the second quarter. So that will affect the non-fair box revenue uh, that we currently exist, where it's down. So we That's expect correct. that next one will be uh, on the positive side. Yes. Any other questions? If there are no questions, okay, thank you, Jeremy. Thank you. Our next order of business is the Independence Auditor's report. That item has been deferred until June. And our next order of business is the review of an ordinance authorizing the establishment of a short-term borrowing program for capital purposes secured by sales tax receipts and or certain IGA revenues authorizing the issuance from time to time of obligations secured by such revenues in an aggregate principal amount outstanding at any one time not in excess of 150 million pursuant to such short-term borrowing program and authorizing the execution and delivery of one or more supplemental indentures under which such obligations are issued. Jeremy. Thank you. Uh, we are asking for uh, consideration on authorization to establish a $150 million line of capital line of credit. Uh, capital projects currently are funded through state federal or CTA bonds, and a capital line of credit provides us two primary benefits. First, uh, the benefit of the capital line of credit is that it will allow the CTA the ability to save interest expense by borrowing only when needed, rather than issuing bonds up front for a multi-year construction project, such as the RPM project. Since the, since the cost of the capital line of credit is based on a short-term rate, the interest rate is several percentage points lower than a bond rate. For example, in current market conditions, it's 2.5% versus 5.5%. Uh, draws would be repaid upon the issuance of CTA bonds. The second benefit of the capital line of credit is that we will receive quicker reimbursement. Uh, federal and state funded projects are front funded by the CTA and subse subsequently reimbursed. Federal reimbursements usually occur within a week, but state reimbursements can often take up to 60 to 90 days. Uh, the capital line of credit is used by many transit agencies across the country as an interim financing tool. Uh, the CTA will solicit bids from firms selected from the current pool of approved bond underwriters approved by the board. So we appreciate consideration for this ordinance and glad to, any, glad to answer any questions. Is this a revolving line of credit? Yes, uh, it is. So as we uh, draw down line of credit funds, uh, you know, and we receive the state funding back or we issue CTA bonds, 
or federal funding, we're able to pay that back and then uh, you know, potentially draw down additional funds uh, as they're required. How Does much do we expect, okay, that we're gonna save, okay, by using these uh, givers? So uh, the interest cost differential of uh, almost three uh, percentage points uh, equates into almost uh, three and a half million dollars a year uh, by utilizing this capital line of credit as an interim financing source. So it's a, it's a great potential advantage for us to utilize this tool. So uh, what's the how is the discrepancy between how the state gets us funds much later than the federal, because you said the federal gives within the week and then it takes 60 to 90 days. Has that typically been the, been the trend or is it because of the budget uh, scenario here in the state? The, uh, the state has always been a little uh, longer than the federal government. Uh, the federal government, uh, just due to kind of the, the, the mechanisms that they have to distribute funds very quickly, uh, but the state has gapped out significantly, uh, unfortunately, due to the, uh, the larger state budget woes. Uh, so that has gapped out considerably to that 60 to 90 day type time frame. So it's at least double, if not longer, uh, what, it, what it has been even in the recent past, but even longer than what we've seen you know, years ago. So Jeremy, question, the line of credit is for how long? So, I mean, how long will we set this up? So the line of credit would be set up for 24 months. Uh, you know, if, we, uh, if, if it works out as we fully expect, we'll be back to the board uh, for additional authorizations uh, to extend the program. Jeremy, um, I'm sorry if you already mentioned this, but what other cities are doing this now? So uh, many other transit companies, uh, you know, LA, Atlanta, Houston, uh, DC, all have similar type uh, capital program, capital line of credit programs set up. Uh, so again, it, you know, it's really just uh, the, the, the pure benefit of the cost savings of borrowing only what you need uh, when you need it and paying at a lower rate until you uh, aggregate up a larger pool to bond out. So it's a, it's a great cost savings for us. Why we haven't used it before? So uh, great question. So you know, as we move forward into the RPM project in particular, uh, you know, that's the largest capital program that we've uh, ever undertaken here at CTA, uh, and it's a multi-year program. Uh, so you know, we don't need all of the uh, funding up front. Uh, this capital line of credit program functions much like our TIFIA loans. Uh, that we currently have, but also the TIFI alone that we will be uh, looking for for the RPM project as well. Uh, so this again, you know, because of the multi-year nature of the construction of the project, uh, this is the, the perfect kind of product for that. Uh, you know, additionally, we have the fact that the, uh, the, the state budget woes, um, you know, have delayed uh, some of the uh, reimbursements longer than what we've seen previously as well. Mr. Chairman, Another point that I would make is that, as you know, <coughs> excuse me, the uh, city implemented a ride hailing fee for CTA that allows us to, to fund certain capital projects. Obviously, the revenue from that, from that particular program will come in over time, but this also gives us the ability to accelerate those projects uh, using the, the line of credit and reimbursing it against the, the revenue stream that's coming in on the ride hailing fee as we move forward. So it'll give us a, a benefit to a local program that we're also trying to accelerate and move forward. And, and just a question, to kind of following it up. How, I know we just got implemented this fiscal year, but when will we get those reimbursements back? Like I know, for example, with REAP, the, the real estate tax we get back from the city, is it quarterly? How do we get those payments back? So for the, uh, the ground transportation tax funding comes in on a monthly basis. Uh, and we've had, you know, no delay uh, on receiving those funds. So they've come in as expected in their full amount. And did you project out how much we expect to get annually? Was there? A uh, so we'll, we'll receive $16 million annually. Okay. Any other questions? And like you said, if the the end of 24 months, you would have to come back before the board if you wanted to extend it. That's correct. So it's only for 24 months. Yes. And, and is guarantee with what? With the 
what is the guarantee okay that the so the uh, the guarantee uh, it will depend on which project we're funding uh, so if it's a sales tax uh, you know kind of a general infrastructure improvement on the CTA we generally use our sales tax credit uh, as uh, President Carter indicated with regard to projects that are uh, involving the ground transportation tax uh, funds uh, those would be pledged so we do have the flexibility uh, based on whatever the eventual funding source will be that we could potentially pledge those revenues as the security for the program and it's a bidding process of the 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 way, the way that we will elect yes so we'll go out for bids uh, among the uh, pool of uh, underwriters that were previously authorized so that includes the likes of you know JP Morgan Bank of America uh, and the like uh, you know so there'll be a, a big pool that will will solicit the uh, the bid too and you know we'll look for the best price any other questions if there are no further questions may I have leave to place this item on the omnibus for approval so moved second, second. our next order of business is the review of an ordinance authorizing a lease of retail space and license agreement for basement space and adjacent property located at 4620 North Broadway Street, Chicago, Illinois. Jeremy. So Mike Wynn, the uh, Director of Revenue, has also joined me. We're excited to uh, present this ordinance for uh, consideration. This is an exciting new opportunity for us to uh, expand the uh, other revenues uh, to the system. And uh, that, frankly, is why uh, you know, finance and revenue are presenting this uh, as opposed to planning. This is uh, a great opportunity for us to capture uh, some additional revenue for the system. So, Mike. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everybody. Mike Gwynn, Director of Revenue and Fair Systems. Uh, presented for your consideration is an agreement with Chicago Cooperative to lease the historic Gerber building at CTA's newly reconstructed Wilson Station. Uh, Chicago Cooperative plans to operate a co-op grocery store under the name Chicago Market there. Chicago Market will offer local, sustainable fresh foods, healthy prepared foods, and all of the amenities of a full-scale grocery store, with the goal of offering the community not just a place to get healthy food, but also a community hub and a meeting place. The lease agreement has three components, the lease of the 13,000 square foot main Gerber building, the building's basement, and the parking spaces adjacent to the building under the elevated structure customers will be able to park or where the market could occasionally hold outdoor events. The term of the lease is a 10-year base with two five-year options. Annual rent for the building will begin at $238,302 and will escalate 3% annually, and the CTA will receive $18,000 annually for the underrail parking area. For a total net present value of $3.76 million over the full term. Chicago Market also plans to invest nearly $1.2 million in capital improvements to the space, so in total, the proposal represents nearly $5 million in value to the CTA. In addition, Chicago Market plans on creating 75 to 80 new permanent jobs and will work with local community groups and Truman College for job recruitment and job training. Chicago Cooperative estimates that it will take approximately 18 months for the necessary design, permitting, and construction to take place. The parcel has uh, long been of interest to the community and has been the subject of various transit-oriented development studies. This proposal uh, presented to you fits the recommendations of both the 2012 <coughs> Urban Land Institute study as well as the UIC TOD Studios study uh, that uh, was performed in 2015. And in fact, this proposal enjoys significant community support with letters of support from over 40 local residents, business owners, and nonprofits and elected officials. Uh, this procurement has been a long time uh, coming uh, and uh, uh, beginning over a year ago. And uh, if, if you'll allow me, I'd like to recognize the hard work of Stina Fish, who's CTA's manager of business development for everything that she did to bring the agreement to completion in establishing CTA's first true transit-oriented development project, as well as giving us a blueprint uh, to follow as we continue to pursue other innovative revenue-generating projects. Uh, thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Any questions? Hey Mike, you got an opening date? You know when it would open? Uh, not yet. It's uh, the Chicago Cooperative estimates about 18 months, so it would be uh, at the earliest, the end of 19. Uh, they've got to do all the design, all of the permitting, all the construction. So there's there's still a fair amount of work to be done. 
I think it's a, it's a great benefit to the community. I mean, as you mentioned, it fits right into the kind of transit-oriented development that you want to have happen. Since we just invested about $240 million at the, at the uh, Wilson Station, so it's a great addition to the station. Um, the building is beautiful. I had a chance to be up there a few months ago with the mayor and also with Doral. Um, it's just beautiful in terms of the Gerber building and even the intern. The, um, Inside, just looking at how they're going to continue to sort of use, I guess, the steps, yeah. the historical mm -hmm. steps within the building, and mm -hmm. kind of lead that to a sort of a passive learning space, conversational piece, and community mm -hmm. government piece. So, great job by Thank you, you and the team. Thank you. Pulling this off and bringing this together, and the fact that you're going to create 75 to 80 new <coughs> jobs as well is just a great benefit as well. Thank you. Yeah, I want to echo that. I mean, it's just a beautiful space. With that in mind, though, are we going to be um, involved uh, looking at the designs and just assuring that it maintains its historical value and everything else? Yeah, thank you. You absolutely will be involved. Uh, they will, uh, the Chicago Cooperative team will be working with our internal departments to review all the plans to make sure that um, the use is appropriate, that there's proper access to the key components. You know, we still have the railroad above this. Uh, so we need to make sure that um, everything meets the safety and the service needs and the maintenance needs of, of uh, CTA. So we'll be, we'll be deeply involved in all of that. And then do we have any idea with regards to the types of jobs? I mean, that's fantastic that there'll be that amount of jobs that will be generated, but do we have any idea what types of jobs this will be? Uh, that will be determined as they go forward, but it will, you know, it can run the gamut of, of people supporting it, um, you know, stockers, uh, cashiers, uh, just everything that goes into making a grocery store operate uh, is on the table. That's great. Are, are we going to be spending any type of maintenance uh, ourselves? Okay. Uh, the 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 operations maintenance is all uh, their responsibility. It's all their responsibility. Yeah. Uh, yes, as a matter of fact, we have uh, five of the members of the board here. Uh, they're very excited to get started on this. Uh, it's a local co-op. Um, they've got uh, over a thousand members or owners already established, um, and uh, we've we've got with us Greg uh, Berlowitz, who's the founder of Chicago um, Market Board, Grant Kessler, Kelly Hewitt, Lynn Austin, and Dana McKinney, and the fact that they're here really shows their commitment to the project, uh, their interest in the project. Um, they they have been very active in this entire process all along. So so we're excited that they're a good partner with a good deep community roots uh, to make this project a success. This is a full service question. Yes, full service. Any other questions? No, just thanks to everybody that was involved in this. This is really great. I know the community has really evolved and grown as well, right? Because of, um, I mean, the value even from what I'm hearing is really increasing around There's, the there's. Yeah, it, uh, indeed. There's been a lot of development going on, and with the sparkling new station there that's really uh, gorgeous, um, it, it stands to be a, a catalyst for even more. That's great. Thank you. Any questions? If there are no further questions, may I have leave to place this item on the opening was for approval? So moved. I'll second. Our next order of business is the review of an ordinance authorizing an intergovernmental agreement with the Regional Transportation Authority for Ventra Cars for RTA Special Fare Programs. Jeremy and Mike. Uh, thank you again. Um, this is a renewal of an IGA that we have with the RTA uh, to handle how they procure with their card stock that they print their RTA Special Fare Program cards on. So this is essentially the same uh, IGA that we came forward with in 2013 uh, with just mild changes. Uh, we've made this an ongoing IGA instead of having to come back every five years. That can be terminated upon 90 days written notice by either party. And we made, uh, uh, gave us more flexibility to, to uh, charge the actual cost of the card stock instead of a fixed set cost, which was in the original IGA. RTA has been a great partner uh, to work with, uh, with Ventra. Uh, with a lot of our uh, fraud prevention uh, initiatives and um, 
happy to answer any questions that you have. Any questions? And just this one, is this to be, I remember there was legislation passed, and I think Will Burns at one point passed the legislation where all of the service agencies at one point would be being used to same fair like, is this part of that as well? So th this is an out. Uh, uh, it's it's an outcome of that. So so uh, all the service boards are now, especially with the Ventra app, able to accept Ventra. Uh, I believe the legislation that you're talking about uh, required them all to be able to uh, take uh, contactless uh, fair media. Uh, Ventra uh, takes care of of that. Um, this is uh, a kind of an offshoot of that because the RTA, which manages those free and reduced ride programs, uh, needed to uh, get card stock that functioned on the new Ventra system. So this, this allows them to do that. Any well, questions? Question. Um, is there any progress on um, the effort to get, uh, allow for ADA paratransit customers to be able to use their ADA paratransit cards on fixed route? Uh, that is a question better asked to PACE. Um, uh, they, as I understand it, are, are working on solutions, but I don't have any specifics. Okay. That I just I, didn't know if you had any, any, any updates. Yeah, uh, sorry. That's right. Thanks. Any other questions? If there are no further questions, may I have leave to place this item on the omnibus for approval? So moved. So, second. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next order of business is the review of an ordinance authorizing a lease of retail concession space located at 2523 North Kelsey Boulevard, Chicago, Illinois. Carol, welcome and congratulations. Good morning. Um, Good morning. Good morning. Carol Moore, your Chief Infrastructure Officer. Um, presented for your consideration is a recommendation to authorize a lease of retail concession space located at 2523 North Kedzie in Chicago. CTA owns the building located at uh, 2523 to 25 North Kedzie as part of its legacy assets. Most recently, the building was leased to First Midwest Bank and the lease expired in March of uh, this year, March 31st. First Midwest elected not to renew the lease. In anticipation of the lease termination, CTA marketed the property for a long-term ground lease. CTA is currently in negotiations with the high bidder, and it is anticipated that the high bidder will utilize the site for development. City Lit Books, an independent bookstore, was a subtenant of First Midwest and is a popular <coughs> local business. City Lit requested an additional year to look for an alternative location in the neighborhood. As the one-year lease does not interfere with the high bidder's plans for the property, CTA asked JLL to market the property for 30 days to see if there was any other interest. City Lit Books was a sole bidder and has offered uh, $20,668 annually for the um, 2,433 square foot space, which is consistent with the terms of its sublease. CTA staff recommends the lease to City Lit Books. I'd be happy to take any questions. Any questions? If there are no further questions, may I have leave to place this item on the only one for approval? So moved. so moved. Thank you, Carl. Our next order of business is the review of an ordinance authorizing an intergovernmental agreement with the City of Chicago through its Office of Emergency Management and Communications for Security, Camera Maintenance and Installations. Veronica. Here. Good, morning. Good, morning. Good morning. Good morning. Veronica Lanis, Chief of Strategy, Data, and Technology. With me this morning is our Director of Technology Engineering, who's in charge of all telecommunications and network systems, including cameras. Presented for your consideration this morning is an ordinance authorizing an intergovernmental agreement with the City of Chicago through its Office of Emergency Management and Communications for security camera maintenance and installation services. As previously announced, the CTA is embarking on a multi-year program known as Safe and Secure to upgrade, modernize, and expand the CTA security camera system and communications network across the authority. Portions of the Safe and Secure campaign involve installing cameras and expanding communications at rail and bus facilities 
not currently served or supported by the CTA's network, such as bus turnarounds, transit signal priority corridors, bus garages, or rail yards. To enable safe and secure projects at these locations, staff wishes to enter into an intergovernmental agreement with the City of Chicago to partner with the Office of Emergency Management and Communications, where city infrastructure and or city resources are necessary to effectively and efficiently deliver select pro uh, projects. The IGA will include the necessary integration with the OEMC network, as OEMC has a prerequisite knowledge, experience, and authorization to perform the reference work within the OEMC environment. <coughs> projects will be executed via a service request from the CTA to OEMC each individual service request will specify a mutually agreed upon scope of work, cost estimate, funding source, schedule, DBE participation, or MWB participation if permitted under the funding source. Each service request will also specify any special insurance, right of entry, indemnification, or grant compliance requir requirements if applicable. As part of this process, the CTA Diversity Department will review each service request for possible subcontracting opportunities, and OEMC will report any subcontractor participation that includes DBE or MWB. Each individual service request will be mutually authorized by the CTA's Chief of Strategy, Data and Technology, or the Vice President of Technology, and the OEMC's Executive Director. A summary of the executed work will be prepared for monthly board reports for the duration of the agreement. The IG is structured to utilize capital and operating funds such as Federal Department of Homeland Security and uh, State of Illinois grants, as well as the city's ground transportation tax funds. The CTA will provide payment on a reimbursement basis to the OAMC for the cost of approved service requests and expenditures under this IGA will not exceed $5 million over the course of a five-year term. Uh, we appreciate your consideration of this ordinance. So we're happy to answer any questions. Any questions? Uh, more of a statement, Veronica. It would be great probably quarterly or once we get into it, uh, maybe every six months or something, you know, but just to be able to come back to the board and just update us on how the agreement is working, you know, the scope of services, just, I would like to see the board be updated at least twice a year, if not quarterly. Certainly, we will do that. We have 3,800 cameras. What is our objective? Where do we want to get? So the 3,800 cameras that are referenced in the documents are only for rail station facilities. Perfect. Total, we have 32,000 across the whole authority. Here we're only referencing facilities because that's primarily where we need to coordinate with the city. Um, do you want to talk about the additional cameras that we're installing? The, the additional cameras, excuse me, Herb Nitz, Director of Technology Engineering. Uh, the additional cameras we're looking at in the Safety and Secure Program are expanding out to bus turnarounds, uh, exterior perimeters around our rail yards or bus garages. And, and we can get to anywhere on our right-of-way, but once we have to leave our right-of-way, uh, and use city streets, that's where the partnership with OEMC will, will come in very uh, handily. And uh, whether it's leveraging OEMC's network or the resources, it allows us to get these additional cameras uh, to these facilities. And we have many shapes and sizes of bus turnarounds and other facilities, just uh, upwards of 120 bus turnarounds in the, the program we want to hit. And uh, in terms of additional cameras, we're looking to add an additional 1,000 cameras above the 3,800 that we've referenced in our, our current rail facilities. And that includes uh, about 650 cameras uh, at rail stations and another 350 at, at the bus turnarounds for a net increase of 1,000 over the life of the program. And what is the shelf life of the camera? Okay, How often do you get to change them? Uh, we're working on a 10-year life cycle for cameras. Uh, we. We tend to, uh, to become technologically obsolete before we're, we're physically obsolete. So we, it is a very dynamic environment for us, and we, we do need to try to stay on the uh, on the edge of, of technology developments and, and, and leverage those technology developments to, to our advantage. And those technology developments also 
help us get more coverage. So one example would be, you know, a lot of the installations we've been doing in recent years have been 360 cameras. So instead of having to install more cameras, a 360 camera can give us probably similar coverage than um, a handful of cameras. Now, I, assume we're able to, I'm sorry. I would assume we're able to update the software with on the cameras that are used with the cameras instead of having to change the camera completely, right? Is that part of what we look at when we're looking at what we're, what we're installing? Uh, with, with digital IP cameras uh, in, in the marketplace, uh, they're all software based. Uh, the, the benefit of the technology comes in uh, the improvements to the resolution and the, the megapixels on the optics of the cameras. So the, uh, the cameras will go through a firmware update as manufacturers release updates to their software. Uh, but the interface to these cameras and software development allows us to hand off that, that digital signal to offloaded systems to do additional processing, whether it's in-house or with the, the city and OMC. How does this mirror other large municipalities as far as from a security standpoint? Are we, you know, behind and with this upgrade, do we get there or are we just ahead of the curve as far as the larger municipality systems? Uh, CTA started installing cameras uh, uh, back in, in 2000, 2001, and we've uh, increased our, our camera count to uh, including our non-rail facilities over 5,000 cameras. Uh, we've tended to, to lead the transit industry with our, our network and our infrastructure. Uh, we have a fiber optic network that extends across the authority, which allows us to, to do uh, a lot more with our cameras than some other uh, municipalities and agencies because we, we tend to own our, our infrastructure. Any other questions? If there are no further questions, may I have leave to place this item on the omnibus for approval? So moved. Second. Thank you. Thank you, Veronica. Thank you. Our final order of business today is the review of two purchase and sales award recommendations. Presenter Ellie McCormick. Good we will. Morning. Good morning. We will start with contract E1. Any questions, please? Contract uh, F1, any questions? I've got a question I would like to sort of, since the contract has already been in place for two years, it would be great to get an update on work and things accomplished to date by the MIT agreement uh, since we're being asked to renew it uh, for another, uh, another year. We'll be happy to do that. MIT is the premier public transportation research in institution in the world, and over the past two years, we've been glad to have their services and their brain power to help us with some of our more challenging problems. Uh, specifically, they have updated and enhanced our origin destination model, which turns uh, unlinked turnstile entry taps into full customer trip and transfer data, uh, which we use daily in our planning and analysis. Uh, they developed another model which looks at customer impact of capacity scenarios during rush hour, which allows us to better measure and address these situations. Uh, they are helping us to look long term at how CTA can lead in an era of new mobility services. In addition, they are assisting us in creating customized analytical models which help us comprehensively analyze bus and rail service, customer impact and opportunities for improvement. And finally, through this relationship, uh, we work not only with very smart masters, doctoral and postdoc students, uh, but we also get access to the cutting edge work that MIT is doing with other global cities. Um, it's, a, it's been a productive and beneficial partnership so far. Yeah, and here's what I would say. All of that is great, but, I, but for as a layman, you know, someone, if you're trying to explain it, again, we, we probably need to do a good job of how we communicate that to the public. Mm -hmm. When we enter into these agreements, my, my, my thinking is, one, how to help us be best in class, how to help us get better, 
how to help us in terms of cost savings. Yeah. So when you're looking at all of these things, there should be some type of way to quantify what's the return on the investment. Mm -hmm. I think it's great that you got great minds looking at it, but at the end of the day for me, it's like, okay, we're gonna spend a half million dollars. What's the return on the investment over that period of time that we can point to to say, guess what, they made this recommendation, so we changed this. And as a result of changing this, it saved this. Mm -hmm. it, so that that's that's what I'm sort of looking for uh, you know, versus more of an ex yeah. in intellectual exercise about transit yeah. globally, mm -hmm. more so, okay, we're making the investment, we've made it for two years, and all of those things sound great, but if you were to translate that into what's the return on the initial two-year investment, and then what's going to be the return on the next year investment, that's what I'm sort of looking for. And again, you can come back and talk with us later or brief us later. That's what I'm looking for, Morris. What's the return on investment for the energy? Sure, I'd be happy to I'd, go. I'd like go to add, okay, to what Chairman Peterson say, okay, that, that will come in the type of projects that we that we are that we take with them okay I mean because that we choose the, the projects right correct yes we choose the projects and then we work with them to to assign the appropriate resources to those projects yep so cho choosing projects okay that you can measure okay the return on the investment okay will be uh, yeah yeah definitely yeah I'm happy to go uh, in depth with you on the, the return on the specific projects but can you talk about yeah. uh, some additionally acquired knowledge that we have now that since we started the project that we're sure. utilizing and possibly using to look at other projects down the road? Definitely. Um, so one example, as I sort of mentioned briefly here, is the um, what we call the origin destination model. So this is, you know, we get entry taps into the system, so people tap when they come onto the system, but we actually sort of don't know where they end up on the other side of that journey. So they're, they're full trip information. So what this model does is it looks at all of their, their taps that we have, not only that, that first tap, but the other taps that we have surrounding that customer to say, you know, this, this customer tapped in here and you could take a, in, for instance, a station like Fullerton or Belmont where you could go on multiple lines in multiple directions and say that based on the other taps that we saw from that customer throughout that day or throughout their history, you know, they, this is what their trip probably looked like. And so then this is the capacity of the vehicles that were traveling, uh, that that passenger traveled on. So it gives us an accurate estimate of, of demand and capacity on those trips that the customers are taking, which is then correlates directly into the service planning that we do. And this was a model, uh, quite frankly, it was developed with MIT 10 years ago, um, and it was in need of an update. Um, so we needed to integrate the new information that we were getting from the Ventra system so that we could accurately capture that demand and appropriately plan for it. And it's a model that's used, used daily as we look at the various scenarios and plan the capacity behind it. So it can help us be a lot more efficient. Doing Absolutely. Does the project become public or is it trademarked for us? Uh, we work with MIT. They'll, the students will write a thesis on the project, so they won't reveal any specific you know, confidential information, but they'll be, they'll be public through their thesis projects. And some of the projects they've even, they, they've asked if they could take it further and submit to the Transportation Research Board or other um, academic places. So um, we'd work with them as we go through that information to, to publish it in a way that, you know, conforms with, conforms with our standards. This might be a question for them. Does TOD have a, uh, a research department just in terms of looking at transit around the country and, and do they share that information as well? We're, we're going outside of just the traditional public sector to get others to come in and take a look, but does TOD itself have a R&D arm internally that they're doing this kind of research as well? T T O D. The Department of Transportation. Oh, D O T. Let <laughs> 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 get to the mic, Terry. Uh, at the federal level, yes, they do have a, a um, uh, research and development group uh, that does sort of similar type of work on a national scope. Um, there's there's nothing at the federal level that necessarily does it at, at the at the level that we're talking about in terms of the individual local. Um, transit systems, but they tend to gather information from all the systems and then do a broader uh, analysis of that. Uh, a lot of times there is also funding that we can pursue 
through through DOT, they can support uh, programs for innovative funding and so on and so forth. So some of the work that the MIT students may ultimately result in are pursuing additional funding from the federal government to actually support that, particularly in the mobility conversations. That's where we're really trying to figure out sort of what are the things that we should be doing that we're not doing now that can actually help reverse some of the trends that we're seeing um, around the, the mobility options that people are utilizing today. Uh, Terry, you and I have had a lot of conversations about certain areas of the city where you're seeing more and more bicycle use and other things. We've been having specific conversations uh, using the MIT group to figure out how we might be able to offer up um, um, uh, various um, programs that could actually be enticing uh, uh, in coordination with, with other services to basically support CTA. Am I correct also from what I read that they're looking at, at an international basis, so bringing in that type of knowledge and seeing how it's applicable to us? Yeah, they have, they have similar agreements with uh, cities around the world, so including London and Singapore and, and um, Hong Kong. They've also done work with Toronto and then they do other, other work in the U.S. with cities like Boston. Um, on the origin to destination modeling um, issue, are they, are they able to look at um, breaking down between different types of fare media used by customers? Um, you know, uh, single-use um, tickets versus cash versus um, other fair media for um, and and identify and make recommendations based on that yes they're able to get into more of the specifics behind it because we have that information through the through the fair system they're able to get that sort of more specific data about maybe the type of rider what type of fair media they're riding on I should point out that that when we were we were going through various scenarios for our fare increase for this year That's right. this was the type of data that was very helpful in us determining ultimately what we thought would be the best recommendation to make to the board that would also generate the revenue uh, that we thought we needed to meet in order to maintain our budget expectations. So uh, that was a critical component in that analysis that, that allowed us to make those decisions. Any other questions? Since there is no further business to come before this committee, may I have a motion to recommend board approval of the omnibus. Excuse me, Chairman. I'm we need sorry. to first I... leave to place those two contracts on the omnibus. So I thought we just need to leave to place them on the omnibus. This, if there is no further question, may I have leave to place these two contracts on the omnibus for board approval? So moved. Now we're, now we're ready. Since there is no further business to come before the committee, may I have a motion to recommend board approval of the omnibus? So moved. Second. May I have a second? Would the secretary call the roll, please? Yes. Uh, Mr. Miller? Yes. Mr. Irvine? Yes. Ms. Alvarez-Alice? Yes. Mr. Peterson? Yes. Mr. Youngblood? Yes. Chairman Silva? Yes. That motion is approved with seven yes votes. No, I'm sorry, there's uh, six. six. It may be seven shortly, but it's six today. <laughs> We're fine. And it's been fi approved. Finally, may I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. All in favor say aye. 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 We're adjourned. We're adjourned. One second, sir. Does anybody need a second? For May 9th, 2018, will the secretary call the roll? Yes, Reverend Miller. Here. Ms. Irvine. Here. Ms. Alvarez Alice. Here. Mr. Silva. Yes. Uh, Mr. Youngblood. Yes. Chairman Peterson. Here. We have a quorum with six members of the board present. Thanks, Greg. The first order of business today is the public comment. Um, Greg? Yes, we have one public comment speaker. I apologize we're running a little late. Mr. Warren, if you would like to step to the front. Uh, uh, microphone should be on and consistent Here. with, yeah, that's fine, Mr. Warren. Just sit right down. And consistent with our rules, we ask you to please limit your uh, comments to three minutes, sir, and go right ahead. Thank you. Yes, I'd like to uh, thank everybody for allowing me to speak in front of this August board. Uh, my mm, agenda is, of course, bicycle safety because I'm a bicycle rider. And I'm hoping that we could possibly have the bus operators an initiative to <clears throat> sensitivity to bike and the, the main problem is uh, that I have personally is like sometimes the operators will start the hydraulic system 
while you're still pulling your bike off the front, which of course is a safety issue. Okay, that's the first one. Uh, the second one is uh, during large activities where you know bikes are not allowed, but the 4th of July, that kind of thing. Could it be possible just to dedicate a car just for bicycles and strollers? Okay, because they're usually the ones that are, you know, asked not to come on the, uh, the train. And I had another one. I didn't write it down. I left my notes. But I just want to, again, you know, thank you for the opportunity to uh, address this board. And I think moving hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people every day, okay, takes a lot of effort. And I think you all have done a very, very good job as a bike rider, to be sure. So thank you. Excuse me, Mr. Warren. Your application your, does mention 24-7 communication. Oh, yes. Uh, thank you. Right, so that's what you forgot, but you put in your <laughs> He's request. He's a tremendous so secretary, you isn't he? He really is. That's so, um, <laughs> my job, sir. <laughs> right. The possibility of having a 1-800 um, type format for travel information. I know because, well, because of the uh, budget, I know that the uh, hours at the RTA information service have been cut back. They close at 7 now. But possibly if the computer, I mean, if you can do, deal with the Guru, the Goro, is it? Guru? Goro or whatever? That the system that you access, you know, from your uh, smartphone? Just possibly, you know, just an 800 number, you know, and you talk to it voice sensitive, activated, you know, to find out you know, where you're going and how you could possibly get there. So, so thank you, Mr. Longini. Well, well let me say this. First of all, Mr. Warren, thank yes, you sir. for coming down to. You're welcome. Durable, who could follow up in terms of there was one safety issue, and yeah, then I um, think one of the issues would be for Brian in terms of, I was looking to see if you know, Bonds communicating, you know, there's 1-800. Um, normally, I'd, I would probably have Don Bonds talk to him. Um, uh, Gwinnett, Gwen, can, can you talk to him in, in Don's absence? Gwen is the head of our, our rail operations and can, can follow up with you and coordinate with the head of our bus operations on the issues you raised around the service. About the issue about the hydraulics? Yes, and, and about the car and the rail car. Yeah. Already? Okay. And then Brian she's, Steele? She's right here in the back. And Brian Steele, who raised his hand, taking notes in terms of, like you said, how to create 24-hour communications, like you said, through a voice-activated 1-800 number. So Yes, the infamous talk lines. Yeah, all right. <laughs> yes, if they can do it for that, they could do it for people trying to get to a destination. All right. Thank you for coming right, down. Uh, Mr. Appreciate Warren, it. one other thing, um, and thank you for coming in your, your comments. Just, um, do you give regular feedback? Um, call the number or email the feedback in or through the website when you have these kind of experiences? How do you mean? Yeah, there's a, CTA has a toll-free number you can call with um, the customer service center. You can give feedback on your experiences, well, positive and negative. Well, yes, there is, but because of the uh, budget uh, restrictions, it's been No, that's, that's the RTA, the CTA. Anyway, I just want to encourage you to, um, to give feedback when you have these kind of experiences, you know, as they happen so they can be followed up. How do you mean the feedback? Uh, you call the number and... Um, what, 188, your CTA? Yes. And and give your feedback. Customer service? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. So thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Ward. Thank you. <coughs> sure. Uh, and that concludes our public comment section today, Chairman Peterson. Thanks, Greg. The next order of business is the approval of the board minutes of 2018, of eight, uh, April 8, 18, 2018, regular board meeting, uh, the meeting the minutes were previously distributed. Any comments? If not, I'll entertain a motion to approve the minutes of the regular board meeting of April 18, 2018. So moved. Second. Second. Uh, Mr. Mr. Miller. Yes. Ms. Irvine. Yes. Ms. Alvarez Alice. Yes. Mr. Silva. Yes. Mr. Youngblood. Abstain. Abstain. Uh, Chairman Peterson. Yes. That motion is approved with five yes votes and an abstention by Mr. Youngblood. Thanks, Greg. We'll now take up executive session matters. It is my understanding that there will be no executive session this morning, Karen. No, Chairman. No, All right. Thank you. I now like to address board item number 5A, approving a resolution 
setting the time of the June 2018th regular board meeting. Since the resolution was previously distributed, may I have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Second. And second. Mr. Miller? Yes. Ms. Irvine? Yes. Ms. Alvarez-Alice? Yes. Mr. Silva? Yes. Mr. Youngblood? Yes. Mr. Peterson? Yes. That motion is approved with six yes votes. Thanks, Greg. The next order of business is a report from the Committee on Strategic Planning and Service Delivery. Director Irvine. Thank you, Chairman Peterson. Uh, the Committee on Strategic Planning and Service Delivery met earlier this morning. The committee approved the following sets of committee minutes. June 14th, 2017, July 12th, 2017, November 15th, 2017, and January 10th, 2018. The committee reviewed the following ordinance, an ordinance authorizing a fifth experiment for bus route number 31, 31st. The committee placed this item on the omnibus and recommended board approval of the omnibus. That concludes my report, Chairman Peterson. Thank you, Director Ryan. The next order of business is a report from the Committee on Finance, Audit, and Budget, Director Silva. The Committee on Finance, Audit, and Budget met earlier this morning. The committee approved the April 2018 minutes. The committee reviewed the finance report. The committee deferred the independent auditor's report for fiscal year 2017 to the June board meeting the committee reviewed the following ordinance. An ordinance authorizing the establishment of a short-term borrowing program for capital purposes secured by sales tax receipts and or certain IICA revenues authorizing the issuance from time to time of obligations secured by such, by such revenues and aggregate principal amount outstanding at any one time not in excess of 150 million to such short-term borrowing program and authorizing the execution and delivery of one or more supplemental indentures under which such obligations are issued. An ordinance authorizing a lease of retail space and license agreement for basement space and an adjacent property located at 4620 North Broadway Street, Chicago, Illinois. An ordinance authorizing an intergovernmental agreement with the Regional Transportation Authority for Ventra Cars for RTA special fare programs. An ordinance authorizing a lease of retail concession space located at 2523 North Casey Boulevard. An ordinance authorizing an intergovernmental agreement with the City of Chicago through its Office of Emergency Management and Communication for Security, Camera Maintenance, and Installation Services. The, the committee also reviewed two purchase and sales award recommendations. The committee recommended board approval of all the ordinance and both of the contracts. The committee placed all of these items on the omnibus for board approval. And that concludes my report, Chairman. Thank you, Director Silva. May I now have a motion to approve the omnibus as stated by Director Irvine and Silva? So moved. Second. Mr. Miller? Yes. Ms. Irvine? Yes. Ms. Alvarez-Alice? Yes. Uh, Mr. Silva? Yes. Mr. Youngblood? Yes. Chairman Peterson? Yes. That motion is approved with six yes votes. Thanks, Greg. The next order of business is a construction report. Chris and Carol. Chris Bouchel, your Chief of Red Purple Modernization. Carol Mori, your Chief Infrastructure Officer. Juan Pablo Prieto, Interim Senior Manager, Diversity Programs. Welcome, Carol. Thank you. Uh, today we have five projects. Um, the first one, the uh, 95th Street Terminal Improvement Program. Um, of course, we had uh, the opening of the South Terminal in the middle of April. Um, thank you for everyone that was able to make it out there. Um, we continue now working very closely with the contractor um, on aggressively moving forward with the North Terminal. Um, the project remains tight to budget and to schedule. We have some photographs here of the opening, um, as well as some of the main features of the south um, elevation of the South Terminal. Um, I think those of you that have driven by here would uh, recognize this as uh, maybe the new gateway um, on the southern side to the city of Chicago. 
um, expanding service um, in line with both the president um, and the board's uh, uh, direction. So it is a, a very positive facility, and uh, we're working hard um, now to bring the north, uh, the north in as well. Uh, Carol, I think, has jumped into that with both feet. Um, and we look forward to, uh, to an exciting conclusion to the project. Um, you can see some of this is not just a facility that improves the lives of our passengers, primarily by providing additional service, but also um, our employees who were working also in a facility that uh, challenged their, um, their ability to provide uh, good service every day. So this new, these new rooms and new services for our employees are a critical part of this project as well. Uh, the loop station, uh, loop station upgrade um, continues uh, tight to budget and tight to schedule. Um, we are working uh, most, uh, most diligently on the uh, completion of the project um, and the installation of the elevators. Um, those of you that have seen the progress out there, uh, we are starting to, uh, to uh, actually install the components of the elevators, the, the rails and the other things um, that end up being a critical part of the elevator structure. Um, in addition, we're beginning the uh, installation of the panels that go on the outside of this, um, something that we took great care in, in designing, um, particularly because this is a historic station. So um, I think we've risen to the challenge of, uh, of making that accessible, yet honoring the uh, historical nature of the project. Um, installation of stairs um, and other components. Uh, moving on to the Ravenswood Loop Signal Upgrade Project. Um, this project continues um, on budget and tight to schedule. Um, we continue to get into the installation uh, of the various components on this project. So as you know, we install switch machines, cabling, um, and signal houses. So the one progress you're seeing here is really this um, is the com a, a completed or nearly completed relay house. So you've seen us build the platform, run the cabling. Now you're seeing the kind of the completion of some of the critical wiring um, and the care that goes into that wiring. Every wire in this system is identified um, and they're dressed in a way that um, enables our maintainers once we've taken um, use of this to uh, to be able to work and maintain these in an efficient process. Um, Illinois Medical District um, continues uh, again tight to budget, tight to schedule, um, but good progress particularly at Ogden. Um, you can see from the photographs a lot of the, the bones of this and this has been a challenge for us because of some of the deteriorated concrete we um, discovered out there as well as some of the storm damage, but um, you can kind of see the bones of, of this new station, this new accessible station house uh, taking place here. So we look forward to the installation of the, of the elevator in Ogden and the reopening of this um, and the Paulina entrance as well. Um, we're looking at uh, August, um, so but we're sort of we're in the process of refining how that Paulina and how um, how uh, the Ogden entrances work together because of the amount of work that's occurring um, really at Ogden, making sure that uh, we open those two in concert and the passengers that would get on at Paulina can make it um, by that area should we open it a little early. I mean Paulina is a little simpler piece of work, but its main challenge is sort of getting through the construction area um, and to the area where the service is being provided at the moment at Damon. So um, those stations, as you kind of stack them west to east, would be Damon, Ogden, and Paulina. So if we open Paulina early, we just want to make sure everyone can get by Ogden safely before it opens uh, in the summer. Uh, East Lake, Milwaukee, uh, Illinois station uh, continues on time and on budget. Um, the usual progression on these is to uh, do the exterior work. You've seen photographs of that. Um, then we go through a period of doing some deep infrastructure in and around the, um, the substation that, that, and the testing of this utility grade equipment that goes in to the installation of that equipment at the various um, substations. So here uh, you can see the installation delivery of a transformer. Um, some of the DC breakers, as you know, we transform power, um, then we rectify it and turn it into from AC to DC, and then these breakers at various stages control our ability to turn it off or to provide it to distinct areas. It's really, in many ways, a much more heavy-duty uh, type of system, but not dissimilar in components to those that were common and we understand in our own homes. Uh, everything's bigger. Uh, those little tiny things that you see and flip the switch on, that's the equivalent here of the industrial size one, so it's you know as, as wide as we are and as tall as we are, so it's not just a little thing goes into the panel. Question: Once you install this, what's the life expectancy? How long before you have to go back and do it? 
Uh, generally speaking, um, this equipment has an industry life standard of approximately 20 years. Um, we take excellent care of it, um, so sometimes we can get a little bit more time out of that. Um, but we also, as we install and renovate these, make assumptions on capacity. Um, so they, much like the amperage of your service at home, um, we make certain assumptions when we install it um, that also have to be revisited as time goes on. I and mean, we have areas in the system where the traction power capacity um, where we're at traction power capacity. So expanding that is also part of our program. So it's not just replacing it um, after 20 plus years. It's also looking at places where we need to expand it. And the maintenance is done in-house? The maintenance is done in-house by uh, local 134 substation electricians. And that concludes my presentation. I have a question. It's not really related to these projects, but um, the, the Washington Wabash elevator, I just keep noticing it's out. I mean, it's, when I was coming in this morning, it was out again from yesterday. Mm -hmm. and it's a new elevator. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, well, it was one of the elevators that was out. Mm -hmm. Is there um, anything unusual about that elevator where it keeps um, going out? And I'm just wondering if there's anything that's present there that um, we're going to avoid in the, the new Quincy elevators. Well, I would say that our, uh, you know, we're working very closely with CDOT, who constructed that station, um, on the uh, elevator issues out there, and with the manufacturer um, of those elevators to to make sure we can address it here first and foremost, but that we learn from any issues that arise out of it. So, I can't tell you that there have been any specific issues. Um, in general, the commissioning of these pieces of equipment is extremely important, and. Um, making sure that we have the time to do that and that we work very closely with the um, electrical contractor, the elevator installer, and, uh, and the general contractor to, to have the space to do that properly. That's, that's always a challenge. This new pieces of infrastructure are very, um, they're, they have a lot more technology in them. Um, they're, they're, they're good, solid pieces of infrastructure, um, but making sure we can commission them correctly is critical. So, we're working through all of those issues with our partner CDOT, and um, I expect that we'll, we'll have them resolved as, as it goes forward. One, one of the other things that we have done, as, as Chris mentioned, because these are new elevators, they're all under warranty, and as such, the, the manufacturer elevator basically comes in and repairs it. But I've asked Chris and his team, or now Carol and her team, to basically get access to those records so we can actually know what went wrong and what they fixed so that we can then learn from that and apply that in terms of lessons that we may need for future elevators that we're building ourselves. And the other change that we're making, um, so starting at um, Illinois Medical District, we'll be commissioning a new elevator. We're bringing in some additional resources, specific elevator commissioning uh, group to provide some, some consulting services and make sure we get that done right. Great, thank you. <coughs> So on the uh, IMD station, the DBE commitment um, is meeting the goal. Uh, so the contractor is on track to meet their DBE commitment. Are we involved in local communities we reaching out and advising? Uh, so before the contract was awarded, uh, we held outreach events with the contractor to make sure that they reached out to as uh, much of the DBE community as possible. We held several events. Um, and they needed to turn in their DBs at time of bid. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. So, Chris, first of all, let me just congratulate you and Carol again uh, on your promotion. Uh, it just goes to show that no good deed goes unrewarded. More work, no more money. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> just new titles. Uh, I'm sure Dover will figure out the rest, but again, congratulations uh, to both of you. Uh, again, it's always important to have a bench because, you know, one of the things that I've learned in 28 years of being in public service is that good people do move up or retire or whatever, and you always want to have, you know, good people behind you. So I think you taking over the largest project that, you know, I've been here now um, since 2009. I mean, this, this red purple modernization project is going to be a signature project just as Carol will take on, uh, complete the 95th Street Station, but then will be tasked with working on the red line extension from 95th Street to 130th Street. So again, 
you know, a uh, lot of work that we're doing. It's like you almost do the day to day, but then you've got the visionary things that we're trying to accomplish, the extension, the red purple modernization project. At some point, if we get a capital bill, we've got to continue to do the investment on the blue line uh, along the, uh, the Eisenhower. We've got to get uh, to that station as well. So again, congratulations uh, to both of you and to everyone that uh, the Dover, uh promoted. It's just great to have that kind of in-house talent where you can promote upward, but then you can also give the folks who've been there the opportunity to move up and take on additional responsibility. And I know Doval has some additional comments uh, uh, about a team member of yours who I was just shocked that they were young enough to have been here as long as they've been here. <laughs> yes. Um, I I'm sure Chris may have some things to say about about this individual as well, but I wanted to make sure that the board was aware of the fact that uh, uh, we're about to lose a very valued member of the team who has decided that he is, for some reason, put in enough years to basically call it a day. Uh, uh, Bob Whitman, who oversees our, our construction operation under under uh, Carroll's shop now, um, uh, is going to be leaving us soon, and this is going to be his last board meeting uh, that he's attending uh, with CTA. I've known Bob for a number of years and have watched him, you know, grow up into and take over the a leadership role in the construction group. And, and he certainly has a legacy of projects and work that he has done here that CTA will benefit from for decades to come. And uh, I personally want to thank Bob for his commitment and service to CTA and, and uh, not only the work he's done on all these projects, but the team he's developed underneath them that, that uh, uh, have proven very capable of, of managing, you know, a myriad of, of projects over the years. Uh, and, and obviously wish them all the best in retirement. And I, I will now turn it over to Chris, who I'm sure wants to say a few words as well. Well, well I do. First of all, let's, uh, let's have Bob come up in case folks don't, because he's always behind the scenes. Let's have him come up. Come on, come on up, come on up. You know? <laughs> because yes. unless you really have had some time, and when I've gone out to projects, I recall when I went out to the Wilson station, had a chance to walk with him. But the way you see him sitting in the back, kind of unassuming, quiet, that's pretty much his demeanor all the time. But anyway, go ahead on, Chris. Well, I'm, I'm going to, you know, less is more in this one. I certainly will say uh, no person is an island, and um, I've had a great team to help me out that now is, uh, with the exception of Bob, dedicated to, uh, to the success of, of the projects and delivering better service and better um, infrastructure to our customers. Um, so I definitely want to thank Bob, but um, in this case, I actually just want to stand up and give him a round of applause. <laughs> shared it with me this morning, I thought, wow, his hair is still black. <laughs> <laughs> Two, I thought, well, when did he start, you know, out of high school? Uh, you know, I'm like, well, he we was 10. Yeah, I was going to say, he, he had an internship at high school and came right here from high school. But, but Bob, on behalf of the board, uh, thank you. You know, one of the things that I know I've enjoyed in my years is that when you drive throughout the city, you can see your imprint. You can see things where you've made a difference for millions of customers who will ride mass transit. And so, you know, it's uh, it's one of those things where folks don't realize all the things that you've been able to be involved in, but those of us who've been here for any length of time uh, appreciate your hard work. And as, as Chris mentioned a little bit earlier, he gets to come up and, and brief us in terms of what's going on with the projects. But a lot of us who got an opportunity to know you that you're behind the scenes with the rest of the team making it happen. So on behalf of the board, again, Congratulations. I, I know you're not going to retire and just sit down. You're too young and play golf. But, but thank you. How, how long have you been here now? Uh, 27 years. 27 years. Yeah. I mean, you did start out of high school. Not quite. Not quite. But uh, if I could, yes. Chairman, just real quick, just let me thank uh, Chris and Carol for their support, uh, President Carter and past presidents and the board's support for having faith in me to, to run the projects. Um, I got to work on so many great projects in my career um, that I think have uh, benefited our customers, uh, Brown Line Capacity Expansion, Red Line South, uh, 95th, Wilson. Um, so uh, again, it's been, a, it's been a great time working here. I've got to work on so many great things and work with a lot of great people who are all sitting in this room here. So I'm gonna miss that 
uh, obviously the most. So uh, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Greg, is there any new business to come before the board? No, sir. Uh, with no further business to come before the board, may I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. All in favor say aye. Aye. We're adjourned. Thank you.